Please join me again in prayer. Holy Spirit, you place the truth within each of us. Please help us to have the wisdom and the patience to listen for it. And when we hear it, the courage to act. Amen. So looking at our reading from John this morning, uh, we have Pilate again. Um, and this is another one of the gospel stories of Pilate's examination of Jesus. And actually the lectionary, for whatever reason, leaves out verse 18. Verse 18 is that famous verse where Pilate responds to Jesus and what is truth? And then, you know, sends him off to be uh, beaten and executed. And Pilate is doing something here that I find really aggravating, and it's also very common. I see it a lot. And it's a, it's a disingenuous search for truth. Um, has anyone seen that Steven Crowder meme where he's sitting on, like, a college campus with a table and then there's a sign on the table and it says something, something, prove me wrong, right? So some of you have seen that meme and you add in whatever, you know, uh, whatever it is you want to believe and then prove me wrong underneath. And he's a great example of that because he's one of the more disingenuous people I can think of. He's never changed his mind about anything and he's been very open about this. Uh, what he wants to do is, is have this bad faith conversation Supposedly it's about truth and changing our minds and really it's about uh, trolling college kids and getting views for his YouTube page. Um, this happens a lot on, on social media um, that people pretend to be engaging in a quest for truth when really it's in bad faith and they already have an agenda. And they're going to enact that agenda no matter what else happens. And this is the sense I get from Pontius Pilate in, in the different uh, exchanges that they have in the, in the Gospels, or the ways the Gospels pre pre present this exchange. That I don't think Jesus is going to say something here that will save his life. I don't think Jesus is going to convince Pontius Pilate of anything. I think he's just sort of grandstanding and washing his hands and playing to the crowd and wanting to appear that he's part of this quest for truth, but really he's just a, a governor uh, enacting the law, and he's going to do what a government functionary does um, in the Roman Empire, which is uh, kill people who resist. And so Pontius Pilate and Jesus are, are sort of having this back and forth, and you can feel Jesus losing patience with this game. At least I can in the text. Like, Pontius Pilate says, oh, you're a king? And Jesus is like, well, you call me a king. I you know, my kingdom is not from here. Uh, he tries to explain things to Pilate, but Pilate isn't interested in hearing what Jesus has to say. And so Jesus ends by saying, the people I'm here for know me because I speak the truth and they hear what I have to say. Pilate has clearly not heard anything that he says and sends him, releases Barabbas, and then sends him to be beaten and humiliated and crucified. Jesus makes the point that his kingdom is not from here. And so I was thinking about this passage um, and listening to uh, the news periodically as it filters in um, and thinking about uh, a concrete example of the kind of behavior that tells you a kingdom is from here as opposed to Christ's kingdom. And I think I have a good example. Has anyone been following the news uh, on the border between Belarus and Poland? A few hands go up. Yeah, so I was listening to uh, a couple of stories about the situation, and I'll try to frame it quickly. Uh, migrants, uh, refugees, people seeking asylum have come from the Middle East and they're headed to the European Union, right? This is a story we've heard many times over and over and over. And the way they've come through this time is through uh, Belarus, um, which is an old Soviet republic, declared independence, and now it's run by a totalitarian uh, crazy person. 
So they're passing through Belarus on their way to Poland, which is the first country in the EU. It's the easternmost country in the EU in that area. And so these refugees, these asylum seekers are stuck on the border between Belarus and Poland. Poland has soldiers on their side and fences and, and, and uh, razor wire. And if people try to cross, uh, they get hit with fire hoses and tear gas um, and driven back. At the same time, Belarus is not allowing any humanitarian aid to get to the people who are there, not allowing any video cameras or journalists to come and document what's happening. And this is all in the midst of a really dense old growth forest, one of the few old growth forests left in all of Europe. And so there are people wandering through dense ancient forest with no water, no food, no place to stay. Uh, they aren't welcome in Belarus, they can't get into Poland, and where they come from is so terrifying that they fled. So they're not going back there. And so this is the situation, and it's, it's going on right now, and it's quite ugly. But one of the things that struck me was on the Polish side. The government of Poland has gone to great lengths to, prevent, to present these refugees as really horrific invaders who are dangerous and who are perverted and evil. Uh, they've had X-rated things on their national news um, to try to sort of lie about these people and the threat that they present. Um, kids in the room, so I won't say more. But what's happening in Poland, like if you're a person living in eastern Poland, you go out in the morning to your garden and you find an exhausted, dehydrated family huddled there in your garden. Um, and they're disoriented, they're not sure where they are, on what side of the border they're in, they haven't had food in days. And so you, you hopefully are moved by empathy and you take them in, you try to help them. But when you try to get help from the Polish government, their official stance is, these people cannot exist. Because the Polish government says that we have defended you from these evil invaders. There are no evil invaders. We have driven them out. And at the same time, there are people in Poland finding refugees in their yard, in their garden, in their orchard, and trying to help them. And the government's official position is, there is no person there. We're not going to help them because there's no one to help. They're basically saying, their official stance is, you're imagining it. And so these people are literally rendered invisible. And I feel like that is an example that rings true for how kingdoms work when the kingdom is from here. Whether the kingdom is run by a king or a dear leader or a president or a prime minister or whatever. This is kingdom logic at work. The kingdom of this world has created this situation where people in desperate need are invisible. And they don't, the only way to deal with them is to say they don't exist. I talk about kingdoms because today is Christ the King Sunday. And of course, Christ the King Sunday isn't just about kingdoms because we don't live, for the most part, in kingdoms any longer. There are a handful of kingdoms left in the world. Most of them are constitutional monarchies where the king and queen are kind of celebrities, don't have a lot of power. But I want to give credit to Reverend Nadia Bowles Weber for reminding me this past week that Christ the King Sunday is relatively new. The feast of Christ the King is ancient. It is an ancient Catholic high feast day. But Christ the King Sunday was instituted by Pope Pius XI about a hundred years ago. And it was first celebrated in the holy city of Cincinnati, Ohio. That was the first place that Christ the King Sunday was celebrated in a Catholic church. And Christ the King Sunday was created by Pope Pius explicitly as an act of resistance against the rise of fascism in Europe and the rise of the Nazi party. He felt that there had to be something in the faith to contend against the threat of fascism. And so he instituted Christ the King Sunday, a Sunday when we will explicitly remind ourselves who is king and where his kingdom is and place the question before us, 
What kingdom are we going to live in? So Christ the King Sunday isn't just about remembering that we have uh, today is an anti-fascist holy day for us and for the Roman Catholics. But I wanted to focus more on specifics rather than talk about generalities. So what I did is I just looked in the Presbyterian Church USA news service for this week. And I tried to find examples of what it means to live in Christ's kingdom, which is not from here. In contrast to the other kingdoms that contend for our allegiance and our loyalty and uh, our trust. And so I found some interesting examples that I put forward as examples of what it looks like in the Presbyterian Church in our little, relatively small denomination to live in a way that follows Christ the King more than other kings. I read about Reverend Dr. Lisa Allen McLaren, who is working and has been working for years to do what she calls decolonizing worship. So if you think about it, Christian worship around the world is sort of strange in that if you're in South Korea, the standard worship is in a European style. And if you're in Mexico, the standard worship is a European style. And if you are on a Native American reservation in the United States, the standard worship style is a European worship style, kind of the style that we have. And that's been true for a few hundred years now. And this isn't because everyone met equally and decided Europe has the best kind of worship. It's because of colonization. All the places the European empires colonized, uh, they brought their culture and their version of Christianity there. And so what Reverend Dr. Lisa Allen McLaren calls decolonizing worship is simply the idea that we take people who have been colonized and we look at how they want to worship according to their culture, according to their values. Where we can, we recover parts of their culture and worship styles that were destroyed or denied. But essentially, we take colonized people and put them at the center of our attention and ask, okay, what does worship look like now? Our co-moderator, Reverend George Bentley, with his own congregation, is uh, working in the area of uh, prison and mass incarceration. Um, when I say mass incarceration, uh, America has a lot of people in prison. We have like 5% of the world's population and 25% of the world's prison population. Like we're a culture that for a variety of reasons puts a lot of our people in prison. And so mass incarceration refers to that. But his ministry is with people who are formerly incarcerated, who are getting out of prison, who are returning to society. And when they do that, there are a ton of stigmas they have to deal with. Like in theory, once you're out of prison, you've been punished, you've paid the price that society said you had to pay, and in theory, you'd be done and you could move on. But this is never true. If you've ever worked with someone or known someone who was formerly incarcerated, it's, it's life-destroying, and it's something you're going to have to struggle with for the rest of your life. And we have all kinds of stigmas about if we call someone a criminal or a con, you know, uh, if we learn someone spent time in prison, our thoughts about them tend to change. And so what he's doing is he's leading his congregation to open their doors explicitly to people who are leaving prison. So that as a way to contend with mass incarceration and the stigma, they are opening their doors to people who are coming out of prison, saying, come to our church. You are a beloved child of God. You are welcome here. We saved you a seat. Come and join us. This doesn't fix all the things that they have to deal with in life, but it's a way of living in a kingdom that is not from here. The Presbyterian Church, uh, Presbyterian peacemakers have a long-standing ministry of what's called accompaniment. And what that boils down to essentially is that we send people from the United States uh, to other countries to accompany local organizers and community leaders to keep them safe. In some extreme cases, this is literally the calculus. 
that if a community leader is traveling through a country, there's a, a chance they'll be assassinated by a militia or a paramilitary or by their own government. But if an American, in particular, I have to say, a white person, is sitting in the car with them, then their government won't risk killing them as easily because that would bring unwanted attention. And we've been keeping people alive by doing this for decades as Presbyterians. And it's, I get goosebumps thinking of how terrifying this would be. But just by riding in the car and traveling with people in some countries, you keep them alive. And so one of the places that this accompany, these accompany, accompaniers, accompaniers, these peacemakers have been working is in La Oroya, Peru. This is a place that is the most heavy metal poisoned place on earth. So cadmium and mercury and all those metals that get in your blood and cause horrific damage, this is the worst place for that on earth, or one of the worst places. And this is because two-thirds of Peru's economy is mining. And they want to be known as a country that's open to mining companies, and so they don't have a lot of restrictions on what those companies do. In particular, there is an American company that's mostly at fault for all this heavy metal poisoning. Uh, they were forced to stop working in 2009. But since then, organizers in Peru have been fighting just to get health care for people in the communities affected by the heavy metal poisoning. Just to get hospitals and clinics that focus on addressing heavy metal poisoning. And they fought with the local government, and they won. And then they fought with the national government, and they won. And now there's uh, a law passed by the government that has to be signed by the president of Peru. It started in 2009, remember. And in 2021, it still hasn't been signed. These people still are not receiving health care for the harm that was done. But the people who have been doing that work and fighting that fight that I'd never heard of until this week, people have been doing this for 12 years, they are living in a kingdom that is not from here. Christ's kingdom is not a kingdom from here. And one of the things that means is that Christ's kingdom contends against the world as it is. It contends against the powers as they are. Whether those powers are kings or fascists or colonizers or prisons or mining companies, or any other power that makes claims on us that isn't Christ. And if we seek to be part of Christ's kingdom, which I hope that we do, if we seek to be part of Christ's kingdom, that means we are called to not be from here either. I think that that is the truth that Christ the King speaks. And it is a truth that I need to hear and that I think we need to hear and keep hearing. Amen.